Concurrency is everywhere in modern programming, but what even is it? And how do different programming languages and libraries take varying approaches in their implementations of concurrency? The core idea of concurrency is to be able to write programs that can handle more than one task at a time. This mainly comes from the asynchronous nature of much of today's application level programming. IO operations, such as making a network request when calling an API, take significant amounts of time. It would be a waste for our programs just to sit there and do nothing while they wait. If instead, we could do other things during that time, we can make the most of our available resources. We can start to create a model where multiple different tasks overlap each other, being paused and resumed when there is work to do. A good metaphor here is cooking a meal where you're preparing rice, cooking chicken, and baking a cake. Each of these tasks requires periods of active work followed by waiting times. For instance, while the rice simmers, the chicken needs marinating, and the cake must cool after baking before it can be frosted. Concurrency, in this scenario, is akin to being a solo chef in a kitchen. You manage all three tasks by yourself. You start the rice, and while it cooks, you marinate the chicken. And while the chicken marinates, you mix and bake the cake. This way, you efficiently use the waiting times of one task to progress the others, continuously rotating through the task as each requires attention or enters a waiting period. Now is a good time to contrast this with parallelism. Parallelism is the strategy of running multiple tasks, not by interweaving them, but by truly doing multiple things at the exact same time. The metaphor version of this looks like having three clones of yourself, each dedicated to one of the tasks. One cooks the rice, another handles the chicken, and the third bakes the cake. While this can be more efficient, it introduces a lot of complexity, especially if the clones need to coordinate or share resources like oven space or utensils. The interdependency and communication between clones can lead to conflicts or delays that wouldn't occur if just one person were orchestrating all tasks. The same thing happens when programming. When we share memory across parallel execution contexts, we run into a whole new category of issues that make programming extremely hard to reason about. We often take things for granted, such as the value of a variable not changing unless we explicitly change it, or that a program will run the exact same way every time we execute it. However, in a parallel environment, these assumptions can be violated due to race conditions, where two or more threads attempt to read and write to the same memory location simultaneously. This can lead to unpredictable behavior and bugs that are notoriously difficult to track down and fix. Furthermore, issues like deadlocks, where two or more threads can be indefinitely stuck waiting for each other, add to the complexity. As a result, while parallelism can offer significant performance improvements, it requires careful design and management to avoid these pitfalls. Languages like Rust bring in big, heavy-duty machinery and complex type systems to address these issues, which are necessary if you do in fact need parallelism. This is required, for example, if you're writing very, very low-level, performance-critical code. But the fact is, for most developers writing business applications, where most of your time is spent waiting for I.O., you just don't need parallelism. You need concurrency. With modern serverless computing, you have parallelism at the level of the request or the container. You don't need it baked into your programming language. And if you do, you will pay for it. Let's explore some different approaches to concurrency. Most concurrency implementations share the concept of a thread or execution context. Unlike true hardware-level threads, which run in parallel on different CPU cores, these green threads, as they're often called, exist in the runtime of the language itself, and they often don't run in parallel with other green threads. Though in some languages, such as Go or Erlang, they still can. But then aren't we exactly back to the same problem as before? The difference is message passing, where memory is never shared between threads. Instead, messages are sent from one thread to another. This avoids shared memory altogether, and thus eliminates the issues associated with shared memory and parallelism. In Erlang, every thread or process has its own private memory, and the only way to communicate between processes is through message passing. Go, while allowing shared memory and all the footnotes that come with it, strongly encourages the use of channels for communication between Go routines, its version of green threads. This model is actually a very reasonable approach, but it does require a slightly different way of programming, as well as leaving some performance on the table due to the need to copy memory everywhere. If instead we kept everything on a single thread, we would be limited to only doing one thing at a time, only ever stirring one pot at a time. But assuming that we don't need to be stirring constantly, we're able to complete the entire meal all by ourselves. This is the model of JavaScript's concurrency model, and it has a lot of benefits. 
code only ever runs on one main thread, along the way in queuing work to be done at a later point. When the stack empties and there's no more work to do, the runtime picks the next task off the queue and starts again. This sequential model of concurrency has been extremely successful for writing highly asynchronous web applications, and is one of the reasons JavaScript is so successful as a language. However, most concurrency implementations today still suffer from a variety of flaws, which are best described by Nathaniel J. Smith's 2018 blog post titled Go Statement Considered Harmful, which you should definitely go read, link in description, but I'll briefly summarize now. Something I hope we can all agree on is that Go to is objectively bad. Dijkstra famously wrote about this back in 1968. Every other control flow construct follows a basic pattern. We enter at the top and leave at the bottom. Go to throws this out the window. And it leads to code that is essentially impossible to reason about. The thing is, when we look at many modern approaches to concurrency, they unfortunately look a lot like Go to. Golang's Go keyword and callback based models like JavaScript have the exact same class of problems. We like to think of functions as black boxes. We call them, they do something, maybe even call other functions themselves. But they all eventually unwind and return back to where we called them with a value. Go statements and callbacks blur this distinction. Anytime you call a function, it will eventually return with some value, but did it spawn other Go routines that are still running in the background or set up callbacks that might run in the future? It's impossible to determine without reading the source code. Just like with Go2, we have lost a linear control flow graph. This has serious implications for our code. Resource management becomes extremely difficult as there is no determinate way to say whether or not any asynchronous tasks still have access to a resource before closing it. And if you've ever seen an uncaught promise rejection, you know that Go statements slash callbacks also break error handling. Basically all error handling techniques require having a reliable concept of the current code's caller to determine who is responsible for handling that error. Callbacks and Go statements have no such concept. Similarly to error handling is interruption. The whole idea with async is that things might take a long time to resolve. We need a way to stop work when we decide it's no longer needed. But again, when we spawn callbacks or Go routines in this massive global scope with no handle to them, this is very hard to implement. It's mostly an afterthought in the already mentioned languages and patterns, being optional by default and requiring manual setup and control. This situation actually draws a lot of parallels to manual memory management in C or C++. You should be able to avoid any problems by just writing perfect code, but eventually you or a dependency you use will forget to free some memory or free early or send something across a thread boundary they shouldn't, leading to undefined behavior. I think the general consensus has settled that Rust structured memory management solution is something to pay attention to. Giving memory an owner who represents when it will be freed is a really powerful concept. What if we could apply this to concurrent tasks? What we need is a way to accomplish the same thing as Go or callbacks, that is, assigning concurrent work to be done asynchronously, but in a way that preserves our black box model and linear control flow, and provides first class error handling and interruption through built-in primitives. This is where I want to introduce what I believe is the final piece of the puzzle, structured concurrency. Structured concurrency treats concurrency as a hierarchy of tasks, where tasks have a clear parent-child relationship. When a parent task is canceled or encounters an error, all of its child tasks are automatically canceled as well. This means that when we join a spawned coroutine, we can be certain that it has left no trace. Placing a function in a coroutine can return to being a black box. Whether it spawns a thousand coroutines or zero internally, it doesn't matter to the caller because we can be assured that they will all be gone when the coroutine finishes. This approach simplifies resource management by ensuring that there are no lingering tasks consuming a resource. Structured concurrency also enables interruption and error handling as first class citizens. Now that all concurrent tasks have an owner, it's clear who is responsible for handling children's errors or interrupting children when needed. Now let's explore how structured concurrency can handle various aspects of concurrent programming by looking at some examples. While many languages and libraries have implemented structured concurrency mechanics, today we'll look at Effect, a TypeScript library with an advanced structured concurrency model. What enables Effect's structured concurrency model is the Effect type, a value that contains the steps of a program that can either succeed with some type A or fail with some type E. Effects are run in a fiber. A fiber executes the steps one by one, storing its progress along the way. 
This way, if told to by an external scheduler, it can stop executing the current effect and be resumed later. This is the process by which multiple fibers can be executing effects concurrently. This also enables the famous colored function problem to no longer exist. There is no sync or async effect, only the effect. This is possible because effects preemptive scheduling, similar to Erlang or Go. The difference between a synchronous and an asynchronous function is that the asynchronous function might yield at some point. But if this yielding is handled externally by a preemptive scheduler, it's no longer required for the functions to say whether they yield or not. This is the exact same way languages like Go and Erlang avoid function coloring. But effect enables this in JavaScript, where it's also safe to share memory between concurrent tasks, something you can't do in Erlang or Go. The fiber type is also generic over success and failure types, meaning that when we await the fiber's completion, we get back a type called an exit. An exit can fully encode any possible outcome of a program, whether success, expected failure, unexpected failure, interruption, or even a combination of these outcomes if, for example, two concurrent tasks both fail. Fibers keep track of their children, ensuring that no child lives longer than its parent. This automatic supervision provides many additional guarantees about our programs, as described earlier. Because interruption is first class, fibers also ensure that any scoped resources acquired during their execution are guaranteed to be released as well as providing the ability to define uninterruptible regions for critical sections that always need to run together. While you can totally get away with sharing memory due to JavaScript's strictly single-threaded nature, Effect provides many primitives for asynchronous communication between fibers, such as queues with customizable back pressure. Finally, Effect allows you to customize the scheduler that controls when fibers yield and resume. This enables powerful advanced capabilities, such as giving priority to a fiber that's responsible for updating the UI in a front-end web app, ensuring that the UI is always responsive. Working with fibers is a fairly low-level use case. You can get all the benefits of effects structured concurrency without ever having to touch one directly. All functions that run multiple effects have arguments to allow for unbounded or bounded concurrency and handle spawning and joining fibers for you, as well as automatically interrupting remaining fibers if one fails. No matter what language or technology you work with, concurrency is a massive part of modern application development. It allows us to write highly efficient code when dealing with asynchronous tasks. I hope you have a better understanding of what concurrency is, different approaches to it, and how structured concurrency can improve things even further. If you liked this video, look out for the next one where I'll build a basic fiber runtime completely from scratch so you can see how everything works under the hood. Thanks for watching, and be sure to comment any questions you have. I'd be happy to answer. See you next time.